Sisters and brothers, thank you so much for coming out on this cold, wintry night. I'm really glad to see you here. I want to thank both Sacramento DSA and the Sacramento Central Labor Council for co-sponsoring this event. Labor and socialism separated at birth in America, but now they're coming back together again, perhaps. I'm really glad to see that kind of harmonic convergence taking place. It's a long time coming. Uh, and I want to thank Peter Brogan of both DSA and the Labor Council for helping to put this together. Um, and I'm going to talk for about 30 minutes. Interspersed in there is about 10 or 12 minutes of video. Dean mentioned that I make videos and there was a California labor history series that I produced for California PBS about 20 years ago and you'll be seeing clips from that. Um, and then we'll have time for discussion. So that's the program. I hope that meets with your approval. So I'm going to talk about a few events from California's history and compare and contrast what the standard California history narrative has to say against the perspective offered by labor history. I hope to shed some light from these examples on what we're facing today in the current political context as a labor movement and I also hope to be provocative about that. So let's start the provocation with a question that I've heard many people asking. Is the current administration in Washington, D.C. simply a run-of-the-mill right-wing Republican anti-labor pro-corporate administration along the lines of Reagan's and Bush's, albeit with a dangerous lunatic at the top? Or are we actually facing the onset of fascism in America? I don't mean this as an insult or a swear word. I mean it in relation to how fascism has appeared historically and its common structures over time. Is this the real thing? People have developed checklists to figure this out. I'll share one with you presently. And you can go down that list and make your own determination. Trump's campaign and the rhetoric and actions coming out of him since his election point in the direction that he may well be a fascist and the regime he is building brick by brick is a fascist regime. While we don't have time to go into this fully here, I want to draw your attention to an interesting historical parallel before we move into talking about California labor history proper. It's pertinent because labor history is all about looking to the past for tactics and strategies developed by working people to defend their common interests and those common interests are deeply opposed to and threatened by fascism. Everyone understands that Trump employed a crude racism, misogyny and xenophobia along the way while singing his nostalgic Make America Great Again song. But it's how those elements fuse with others in an extreme reactionary nationalism and a profound disrespect for democracy that makes his rhetoric and actions potentially fascist. Another important element is economics, a fake anti-capitalism, a funhouse mirror image of Bernie Sanders' socialist ideas, although without the fun part. Sanders ran a socialist campaign and named it. He proposed to address growing economic inequality by taxing the rich and creating public programs funded by those taxes to serve the interests of the 99%. Universal health care, free college, rebuilding public infrastructure, reforming labor law so that organizing is once more possible in the private sector. He won 13 million votes and a significant working class following with a mildly anti-capitalist or social democratic program. He named the real problems, especially economic inequality, named the real enemy, the 1%, the big banks out of control corporations, and gave an explicit set of solutions, meaning to unify working and middle class voters. And by the way, Sanders won the largest vote ever officially tabulated for President of the United States by a socialist. Gene Debs, who I'll talk about again in a moment, in 1912, got 6% of the vote. Bernie's primary vote was equal to about 10% of the final electorate. Trump, on the other hand, ran a fascist campaign 
although he failed to mention the fact. That's typical of fascism in its post-World War II incarnation when the term became officially unpopular. His economic appeal to workers was based on the improbable idea that he would bring back manufacturing jobs. Hence the nostalgic, backward-looking, make America great again, and the slogan, America first, lifted from the xenophobic right wing of the 1930s. We saw right away with the carrier company how he actually plans to do this, claiming the minority of jobs the company was already planning to keep as his victory. When the president of the steelworkers local at the plant pointed this out, he earned Trump's bullying tweets and a flood of violent social media threats. The German communist leader, Clara Zetkin, said something of note in 1923. In the wake of World War I, in addition to the Russian Revolution, several other European countries witnessed powerful left-wing workers' movements, some of which came close to socialist revolution. All were eventually put down. <coughs> Surveying the rise of fascism in Italy and Germany, Zetkin observed, and this is 1923, very early on here in the rise of fascism, Fascism, she said, is the punishment inflicted on the European working class for not having continued the revolution begun in Russia. The parallels are not precise, but I'd suggest something similar was going on here recently. The moment of the presidential election in 2016 was ripe for a direct economic appeal to a chunk of America's unhappy white working class. And we want to be careful with our definitions of working class here. People such as, but not inclusive, former manufacturing workers who considered themselves middle class, but found themselves drifting downward toward or into the ranks of the poor. With the failure of Bernie's socialist crusade, we lost a solidarity message in which unity of the working class, white workers and workers of color, women and men, immigrant and native born, might have been the key to putting in place policies to roll back the power of the billionaires and economic inequality. This would have been a natural, effective, and inclusive message to sympathetic working class ears, and I think it would have won, especially in places like Michigan and Wisconsin. Instead, the fake working class message of Trump was able to rush into the vacuum created by Bernie's fall and Clinton's refusal to pick up that banner. We can adopt, adapt Zetkin's astute observation from nearly 100 years ago and propose that Trump's fascism is the punishment inflicted on the American working class for not having extended Sanders' social democratic message into the presidential election. Now let's look at the checklist. Racism, extreme nationalism, xenophobia and scapegoating, a fake socialism, assault on civil liberties, continuously denigrating and delegitimizing the media and the courts, while packing the courts with far right wingers, and a buildup of the war machine. Not to mention the everyday misogyny and assaults on unions moving through the courts and Congress, suppression of voting rights, oh, and the sprouting up of violent street gangs of the right wing. In addition, a true fascist regime doesn't just get elected. It needs a movement on one side of it and willing coalition partners among the more traditional conservative elites on the other side with their desire for tax cuts for the rich and corporations, rollback of social programs, and deregulation of the economy and environment. This is precisely what Mike Pence and his joined at the hip connection to the Koch brothers represents, along with the billionaires in Trump's cabinet and at the top of government agencies and congressional Republican leaders. Having made the case that this might indeed be fascism we're watching being put together here, let me take a step back and say, maybe it's not. Maybe it's just really a bad anti-labor, anti-immigrant administration with strong tendencies toward corruption and authoritarianism. In either case, it looks as if it is attempting to dismantle a couple hundred years 
of our admittedly imperfect American experiment in democracy. And whether it's fascism per se, or some other form of authoritarian rule, may ultimately be a less important distinction than figuring out how to fight it. Let's just bear in mind that contemporary American fascism won't look superficially like the fascisms of the past. Trump probably won't grow a little mustache. The military will not begin goose-stepping during parades. Red, white, and black swastika banners won't begin appearing in the background to press conferences. So we just have to be alert. What is heartening is that since the election, a lot of people have gotten active, figuring out how to turn this around, finding out where we stand and fight, and getting into the streets. <coughs> the growth of DSA is a perfect example of that. You know, explosive growth from seven or 8,000 in 2016 to the 30,000 today. That's really significant. My view is that we must offer information useful to working people who want to fight and provide doorways for working people who don't know where to turn to get the information to do that. I will offer one doorway tonight, labor history. And the fact that I've recently come out with a book on California labor history and I'll be selling it after my presentation at that table is purely coincidental. <laughs> Just a bit of background, Dean mentioned some of it. I've had the great privilege for the last 20 years teaching a course in California labor history at City College of San Francisco. That class, one night a week, has given me the space to ponder how best to reach working people with their own hidden and really suppressed history. The class also created the imperative to find something my students could read. When I realized there wasn't anything suitable, the last book of this sort was written in the 1960s, way behind the times here, I set out to write it myself. And I wrote it because California's history is rich in lessons for how ordinary working people can achieve a measure of justice when faced with injustice. As the labor movement has declined and its density has dropped now to a third of its peak in the 1950s, virtually no one knows the stories anymore behind the victories working people have won. My book recovers those stories so that my students, union leaders and activists, and the interested general public can figure out where our rights as workers came from, what it took to win them, and what we stand to lose if they are taken away. There are two inescapable things about California history, immigration and the gold rush. They are the center of the mainstream narrative about California, which can be boiled down to four words. Come here, get rich. It's pretty much the same idea as the American dream, only more concentrated. The gold rush was a validation of these ideas, though few people actually became rich from the gold rush, or at least from gold mining. But some did, and some became rich in each of the successive gold rushes that the state has experienced. Wheat farms, oil, Hollywood, the World War II defense industry, and today, Silicon Valley and the digital economy. All these gold rushes drew people from across the country and indeed the world. And when some people prospered and their stories were publicized, it further fed the mainstream narrative of come here, get rich. But if one side of the coin is gold, the other is not. Each gold rush also produced many more workers who did not share much of the wealth that they created with their hands. Labor history is about those people. Out of the original gold rush emerged the railroads and the individuals often described in standard history as the people who built the railroads. Charles Crocker, Collis Huntington, Leland Stanford, Mark Hopkins. They were failed miners. They became wealthy by mining the miners, selling food, supplies, and clothing to them, and receiving huge subsidies from the US government to hire the workers who actually built the Central Pacific Railroad. These men amassed gigantic fortunes. They were the poster children for the enormous economic inequality that arose during the Gilded Age following the gold rush. When a terrible economic depression devastated working class communities in the 1870s, there was a backlash and it wasn't pretty. San Francisco's two largest population groups were Irish and Chinese immigrant workers. Out of the fear and anger caused by the economic depression, which threw over 20% of the labor force out of work, emerged the Working Men's Party of California, which briefly swept to power in local offices across the state. 
It was a progressive party in some respects. It had a trade union wing that called for working class unity, for free public education, taxing the rich, and curbing the power of the railroad corporations. But the main impact of the Workingmen's Party of California echoed the words of Irish immigrant Dennis Kearney, who preached an anti-Chinese ideology. The party adopted his slogan, the Chinese must go. The only lasting effect the party had was the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, which banned Chinese immigration for decades. No part of the progressive program, the economic program of the Workingmen's Party that might have benefited all workers was enacted, diverted instead by demagogues into division and xenophobia. I, wa <clears throat> I want to underscore though that even in movements like this, there are always choices for working people and their leadership. To be inclusive versus exclusive, to seek broad unity on behalf of common interests, or allow the employers to divide us by race, ethnicity, language, or national origin. There are also always opportunities produced by worker movements for individuals to act with creative and courageous approaches to solidarity that in turn can grow that movement. Let me offer one example that took place here in Sacramento during the National Pullman Strike of 1894. The workers who built the luxurious Pullman railroad cars near Chicago went on strike shortly after affiliating with a brand new organization, the American Railway Union, or ARU. Unlike the way things had typically been done previously by railroad workers who, organ who organized themselves into many different skilled worker unions, craft unions, the ARU had an industry-wide orientation. Its outstanding leader was Eugene Debs, a locomotive fireman who believed that all railroad workers should be in one big union, enabling them to act in solidarity with one another. Consequently, when the Pullman workers asked for restoration of a wage cut and Pullman refused, the ARU, some 150,000 workers and eventually a quarter million, went on strike all across the country on their behalf. Um, here's what happened on Independence Day in Sacramento. <coughs> I will now read from my book for just a moment. In Sacramento, a tense confrontation between a few thousand strikers and a thousand militiamen on July 4th ended bloodlessly with the retreat of the militia. The impressive solidarity of the workers and community was for the moment holding fast and it was contagious. The San Francisco Chronicle reported after the troops fell back from the depot this afternoon, two companies were ordered to take a Gatling gun and move to the American River Bridge for the purpose of guarding it from possible destruction. As the men had already walked a considerable distance, they were glad to avail themselves of an electric car which ran as far as 28th Street. Orders were given to hitch the gun to the rear end of the car. The conductor objected, but without avail. For the first 10 blocks, the street are paved with asphalt and the gun ran without a jolt. But the motorman, who was interested in the striker's cause, bided his time. And when the car approached 11th Street, where the smooth pavement ends and cobblestones commence, he threw the lever to the top notch and the car sprang forward at full speed. The result was that the gun was so badly damaged that it will have to go to a machine shop for repairs. The national strike was beaten when overwhelming government firepower and court injunctions were deployed on behalf of the railroad corporations. Debs was sent to jail for six months, during which time, pondering the events of the strike, he became a socialist. A decade later in Oxnard in 1903, a better outcome emerged from elements similar to the ones surrounding the Workingmen's Party and its reaction to immigrant workers. Sugar beets were an important crop in California around the turn of the last century. After the Chinese Exclusion Act, beet farmers had difficulty getting enough workers, especially temporary seasonal laborers. There were two types of farm labor, year-round and seasonal, the secure and gig economy workers of their time. 
In Oxnard, white workers were the majority of year-round employees. They generally stayed away from seasonal work if they could. So the growers imported workers from other countries to do the temp work. By the early 1900s, that meant mostly Japanese workers, about 75% of the seasonal workers, with around 20% Mexican, as well as a remnant of about 5% Chinese. Despite the obstacles of race, culture, and language differences that they faced, these workers put together the Japanese-Mexican Labor Alliance, or JMLA, the first union in California's fields, and it prevailed through a well-organized strike although not before one striker, Luis Vasquez, was killed by gunmen hired by the growers. Here's a video clip to show what happened. We worked in your orchards of peaches and prunes And we slept on the ground neath the light of the moon Due to its socialist leadership, the Los Angeles Council of Labor is way ahead of the rest of the labor movement in extending its hand to workers of color. When farm workers reach across barriers of language and race to form the Japanese-Mexican Labor Alliance, Fred Wheeler convinces the all-white labor council to support them in creating the first union in California's fields. Wheeler travels to Oxnard, just north of Los Angeles. He finds a small town. Its stores and services support the famous Southern California citrus industry. But Oxnard is also surrounded by extensive sugar beet farms beneath the shadow of a massive factory. Built in 1897, the second largest sugar works in the United States, it's owned by the Oxnard family, just one of whom lives within a thousand miles of Oxnard. The Oxnards treat the factory managers well, providing them with large houses and nice parties. Oxnard workers are treated less well, especially the farm workers. Brought by labor contractors from Mexico and Japan to work in the beet fields, they live in places like these. They pay inflated prices for their food and supplies in company stores and work long hours planting, thinning, harvesting, and transporting the sugar beets. Early in 1903, the growers, in an attempt to eliminate the middleman, formed their own labor contracting company. The Japanese and Mexican contractors lose business, and workers' wages are cut. Anger helps them to form a union and go on strike. Despite grower-initiated violence reported as a labor riot in the local newspapers, the farm workers stand firm for two months. Few sugar beets make it into the mill. Finally, the boss is back down. With some help from Wheeler, JMLA President Kusuburu Baba, shown here in a photo taken years later, negotiates a settlement restoring workers' pay and giving Japanese and Mexican contractors back their business. Against all odds, the union wins. But its troubles aren't over. The Mexican Secretary of the Alliance, J.M. Lazarus, petitions the National AFL for a union charter. Samuel Gompers responds, It is understood that in issuing this charter to your union, we will under no circumstance accept membership of any Chinese or Japanese. Lazarus and the Mexican members of the Alliance refuse Gompers' condition. They write back, In the past, we have counseled, fought, lived on very short rations with our Japanese brothers and have toiled with them in the fields and they have uniformly been kind and considerate. We would be false to them, to ourselves, to the cause of unionism if we now accepted privileges for ourselves which are not accorded to them. Without connection to the broader labor movement, the JMLA soon disappears from sight. It's worth noting in the post-Bernie Sanders moment that Fred Wheeler, who got the LA Labor Council to support the JMLA, was a socialist. Besides being president of the Labor Council and one of the first organizers hired by the California Labor Federation, he was also, a few years later, 
the first socialist candidate elected to the Los Angeles City Council. Wheeler and socialists like him were much more likely to be fair-minded and anti-racist than non-socialists in the labor movement, although this was not universally true. For instance, writer Jack London, who lived in Oakland, was a fire-eating member of the left wing of the Socialist Party, but also a white supremacist. This moment in 1903, when defeat was snatched from the jaws of victory, was not unusual. The history of labor in the United States is mostly a history of defeats. If it weren't, the country would look a lot more like Sweden, with paid maternity leave, free health care for all, and free education from preschool through university. But on the other hand, there have, been so, there have been some victories here and some movements to get those victories so important that they have kept the U.S. from looking more like Nazi Germany than it might otherwise. The 1934 San Francisco general strike and its aftermath was one of those moments. It remains the most important event in California history that no one remembers anymore. And given what is heading at working people, with a right-wing Republican Congress and President, including the loss of agency fee in the public sector and a national right-to-work law, we should start remembering tactics like this. General strikes are quite rare in United States history. We've only had about a dozen citywide general strikes and none since 1946. There were three in 1934 in the depths of the Great Depression, with 25% unemployment, wages lowered to starvation levels, West Coast maritime workers, including many immigrants, were trying to reorganize the unions that had been busted over the previous 15 years. When the workers across the West Coast were confronted with the complete refusal of their employers to recognize their unions or even to negotiate with them, they went out on a coastwide strike. In San Francisco, two maritime workers, Howard Sperry and Nick Bordeaux, were killed by police during the strike. In response, more than 100,000 workers stopped working in solidarity with the maritime strikers to commemorate the deaths of the two workers and gain some dignity and respect on the job. Here are some images from the events leading up to the general strike. The employers open the ports with a massive show of force. They are determined to crush the maritime workers' strike. The bosses hire a thousand strike breakers in San Francisco alone, including hundreds of black workers who are barred from the union. This tactic is neutralized when the union, breaking with its racist past, approaches African American longshoremen and asks them to join the union and the strike. Many do. But on July 5th, other weapons are turned on the strikers. One witness reports, Struggling knots of longshoremen, closely pressed by offices mounted and on foot, swarmed everywhere. The air was filled with blinding gas, the howl of the sirens, the low boom of the gas guns, the crack of pistol fire, the whine of the bullets, the shouts and curses of sweating men. Everywhere was a rhythmical waving of arms, like trees in the wind, swinging clubs, swinging fists, hurling rocks, hurling bombs. As the police moved from one group to the next, men lay bloody, unconscious, or in convulsions, in the gutters, on the sidewalks, in the streets. Around on Madison Street, a plainclothes man dismounted from a radio car, waved his shotgun nervously at the shouting pickets who scattered. I saw nothing thrown at him. Suddenly, he fired up and down the street, and two men fell in a pool of gore one evidently dead, the other half attempting to rise, but weakening fast. Longshoreman Howard Sperry is dead. A block away, so is cook Nick Bordeaux, who is volunteering in the strike kitchen. For those of you who are wondering what a Gatling gun was in the last segment about the 1894 Pullman strike, you just saw one go by with the National Guard there. 
Um, did you also notice a startlingly contemporary image among the ones you just saw? It was the chalked sidewalk memorial to Sperry and Bordeaux. Could be a Black Lives Matter memorial or one from Charlottesville. There were two main outcomes of the general strike. First, the maritime workers gained union controlled hiring halls, wage increases, and a leap into the what we might loosely call the middle class. The ability to own a home, send their kids to college, and so forth. For a part of the workforce who had been low paid casual labor, completely controlled by the bosses, this was an enormous change. Second, the San Francisco general strike and other similar events, and especially the violence surrounding them, also played a major role in discussions in Congress before passage of the National Labor Relations Act in 1935. The NLRA established the ground rules for peaceful conflict resolution in the workplace. The same rules that are now on the verge of disappearing in the Republican Congress through so-called right to work laws. What rules will apply when the ones we've had are gone? The labor history we know says it won't be pretty. I want to bring us up to the present, but before we talk about recent labor history, I also just want to mention two other important developments contradicting come here, get rich that took place in the 60s and 70s. That's public sector unionism and the United Farm Workers. These two movements involved many thousands of workers and millions of supporters in families and community. They were very much social movements as well as labor movements. Neither would have occurred without the civil rights movement cracking open the Cold War society of the 1950s, and both reflected the spread of anti-racist politics and activism into organized labor. They helped push New Deal policies further, extending the right to collective bargaining to public workers and farm workers, both of whom had been left out of the National Labor Relations Act in 1935. These movements also supplied some of the political muscle that created great society programs like Medicare and Medicaid, or here in California, Medi-Cal. Okay, I'd like to show you a couple of minutes of images from that moment. You didn't accidentally end up standing there with a sign. You had to purposely decide to do it. And once you decide that one time, after that, I mean, you, when you're called on, you can do it again. Although administrators and politicians claim public employee strikes are officially illegal, Dozens occur anyway. The teachers were uh, engaging in strikes and they had no laws to deal with it and nobody knew what to do except put them in jail or, 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 or try to fire them or something. And, they, and all of these solutions just were, frankly, not very satisfying to anybody. By the late 60s and early 70s, teachers and other public sector unionists build an unstoppable momentum in California and across the country. We acted as though we had the power, and we did, in a sense, bargain collectively. We went before the Board of Supervisors, and we had sick outs uh, for, at the hospitals. 1,300 sanitation workers on track, and Memphis is not being fair to them. Martin Luther King Jr.'s involvement in a sanitation worker strike in Memphis, Tennessee, highlights the deep connection between the civil rights movement and public sector unionism. His tragic death during that strike forces authorities to grant the workers union recognition. It also provides a renewed spark for organizing elsewhere. The public workers really put on a fight at the level of the state legislature. And that means that the teachers and the service employees asked me that was the group that really put it on. Keeping up steady pressure, one public worker group after another is granted collective bargaining rights. By 1975, Governor Jerry Brown signs the Educational Employee Relations Act, legalizing collective bargaining for teachers and other school employees. We didn't pin our existence on a law. Uh, 
we were in existence before the law. We acted as if we could bargain before there was a bargaining law. Uh, and so it's a collective action that's behind it, fundamentally. Now, this doesn't deny the fact that uh, Jerry Brown's approval of collective bargaining for farm workers, teachers, and so forth was a very, very helpful and necessary thing for, for us. And thank goodness it happened. The disruptions to business as usual by the public sector union movement, while not as violent as the events of the 1930s, were substantial enough through strikes, sit-ins, demonstrations, civil disobedience, other forms of collective action, that the results were similar. The passage of legislation allowing for collective bargaining. And the same dynamic unfolded in California's fields. Now to the present. Nine years ago, my union, the California Federation of Teachers, understood that it was time to implement one part of the Workingmen's Party program, the taxing the rich part, which the party never got around to making happen because it was too distracted by racism and xenophobia. We were in the middle of the Great Recession following the Wall Street engineered housing bubble and crash. Employment in California was officially 12%, the worst since the Great Depression. 10,000 teachers a year were laid off between 2009 and 2011, totaling more than 10% of the K-12 teacher workforce. Class sizes rose sharply. Student fees skyrocketed in our formerly free colleges and universities, and thousands of courses were no longer being offered. Services to seniors and low-income Californians were slashed. Millions of homes were underwater. You all remember this. This is all recent history. We knew what the solution was. It was to create a millionaire's tax to ask the people who could best afford to do so to pay their fair share of taxes and prevent what remained of the public sector from sliding into the ocean. What we were up against was the preferred interpretation of California as a reliably anti-tax state ever since Prop 13. We didn't believe that that was true anymore. We thought the crash and recession had shifted the understanding of a majority of the electorate about growing economic inequality and what needed to be done. The coalition that CFT worked with to pass Prop 30 in 2012 included a community group called <coughs> Move the Immigrant Vote, which that year turned out more than 50,000 people, newer recent immigrants, to the polls to vote for Prop 30. So with that campaign, we came full circle. Labor and the immigrant community finally did the work together in the 21st century that the Working Men's Party of California failed to do in the 19th century. We did it again with Prop 55 in November of 2016. Here are a few minutes of images from that campaign. This budget deals with the $42 billion deficit which is the biggest deficit that we've ever had. New polling out by the California Federation of Teachers found overwhelming support, 67%, for a higher tax when it hits anyone making a million dollars or more. In response to the crisis, CFT and its community partners built a movement for a millionaire's tax to save schools and services. We showed through mass actions and opinion research that we had enough popular support to win against competing ballot measures. That's when the governor called CFT President Peshtal to talk. Governor Jerry Brown has stopped collecting signatures for his original ballot measure to raise taxes. He's now focusing on a new tax initiative, which is a compromise between his original plan and the tax proposal from the California Federation of Teachers. Californians overcame decades of anti-tax sentiment and approved the first general tax in 20 years. So Proposition 30 is a unifying force. And we had to overcome a lot of obstacles. We overcame them. So we were in free fall. So Prop 30 stabilized the situation, stabilized the situation. And in fact, there, there have been some gains. The eight furlough days that we had to take back, we, we have those back now. So teachers are working more, students are in school more. Some of our classified employees have been restored to partially to where they were in 2012. Some of them went back to 100%. And some of them are still sitting at around 80, and some of them are at 90 percent, uh, including myself. Prop 30 has made a difference. It's, it's made a big difference. It restored several of the classes that I, I had previously taught, and it's meant that it's no longer the case that students have to wait around for the classes that they need. There's a lot more say at the site level of how we're going to be using our dollars to best serve our children. Whether they be English learners 
or from very low-income families, the money essentially follows the student. So opponents of Proposition 30 often made the argument that uh, jobs would be lost, millionaires would leave the state, companies would move away. If Proposition 30 passes, California will have the most crushing tax burden in the United States of America uh, by a long shot. Barry Broom is actively recruiting chief executives from California companies and luring them to Arizona, a land of lower taxes. What we've seen since Proposition 30 was passed in 2012 is the state has added 1.4 million new jobs and we have 10,000 more millionaires than we had when the measure was passed. What this means is, at a minimum, there's really no relationship between raising taxes like we did with Proposition 30 and economic growth. And if any, the evidence points to the alternative, that it might actually be good for the state's economy. As a result of Prop 30 and Prop 55, which was renewal for 12 years of Prop 30, we're bringing in 8 to $9 billion a year for public education and services. And we've gone in a different direction than the rest of the country has at the state level coming out of the Great Recession. And <laughs> thank you. I know a lot of people in this room did a lot of hard work in those campaigns. So thank you all. This is in marked contrast to everything coming out of Washington today, the thrust of which is to privatize education, hand a huge tax cut windfall to the rich, and send the children of working people back to the 19th century. Let's sum up the word you long to hear. The history I have been talking about is clearly different from come here, get rich. The history of most Californians is about the people who came and didn't get rich. The Occupy movement brought us the understanding of the 1% and the 99, whoops, and the 99%. Let's go back here. Occupy. There we go. <clears throat> That's a pretty good estimate of how all these gold rushes have worked out. For a long time, California's economy did fairly well in helping its immigrants to make a decent living. That was the real story behind that happened for most people, to make enough money so that one's family was comfortable and one's kids got a better start than one's parents had. A critical piece of that success story is the labor movement all but invisible in the standard come here, get rich story. Today, California unions represent about 16% of the workforce, which remains considerably better than the national average. If you've only got a 1 in 100 chance to strike it rich, to come here, get rich, a 1 in 6 chance to get at least more comfortable works out a lot better for a lot more people. Clearly, many, many immigrants to California figure this out. Then we revise the narrative. It's not come here, get rich. It's come here, organize, do better. The Trump environment, whether fascist or just really bad, poses special challenges for immigrant workers and organized labor. Both groups significantly overlapping here in California face targeting and scapegoating at the hands of this administration and the right-wing billionaires that support it. We've seen this most clearly around Trump's xenophobia, anti-immigrant rhetoric, and executive orders. But we will also see a spike in the anti-union invective when the Janus versus AFSCME court case hits the Supreme Court this year, and when right-to-work legislation starts seriously moving through Congress. We have to find ways to build the broadest possible unity to stand together and fight, or we will be destroyed by these things. I'd like to think that if I were in Germany in 1932, I would have figured out what was being put together around me. I wouldn't be like Pastor Martin Niemöller, who said, first they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. What I would prefer, well, if this scenario comes to pass, I'm going to be in big trouble because I'm all three. <laughs> so let's not have that happen. I like this alternative to Niemöller's poem that I saw at a demonstration in San Francisco earlier this year. Can you read that in the back? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's absolutely true that any fascist regime is going to go after trade unionists, at least the ones willing to stand together and fight. And if you are a trade unionist and unwilling to stand and fight, there's not much point to being in a union because that is what it is there for. 
By knowing the lessons of labor history and talking them up, we give the public a shot at understanding what's at stake at this moment. Lessons like we lose when we allow ourselves to be divided by racism, xenophobia, sexism, or split along the lines of private and public sector unionism. Lessons like the 1934 San Francisco general strike when we learned that with that level of unity and militancy, we can win and set it up for winning for a good long time. With labor history, we helped to fill the vacuum that should never have opened up in the presidential campaign election, presidential election campaign after Bernie conceded. The vacuum where working people's problems and solutions should have been. Knowing labor history helps to create a progressive labor movement. It's what we've always needed. It's what we need now to defend what's left of the legacy previous generations of trade unionists have left us through their blood, sweat, and tears. So I say to you, if you don't like the labor history that you've got, let's go out and make some of our own. Thank you.